Olive is an ostrich. She lives with her family in the outback. But Olive is very different. Olive's dad loves to run. Olive isn't a fast runner. Olive's mum enjoys laying huge eggs. Hmm. Olive doesn't like the look of that at all. Olive's little brother pecks at the ground to find tasty roots to eat. Pecking at the ground makes Olive sneeze. But Olive has an incredible imagination. So while the rest of her family are running, pecking and laying eggs, Olive can be found imagining herself going on amazing adventures when she buries her head down, down, into the sand. until she popped up somewhere new. It was very dark, except for one light that was pointing straight at her. Oop, Gurk, I'm in the spotlight! exclaimed Olive. She was on stage in a huge theatre. She was wearing a frilly collar and very, very pointy shoes. She could hear someone crying and headed off to investigate. Backstage was dark. She couldn't see anyone anywhere. She noticed the sobbing was coming from under a large furry cushion in the corner. Olive tried to lift up the cushion, but the cushion moved and cried, Ouch! The cushion stood up and Olive saw that it had arms and legs. It wasn't a cushion at all. It was actually a big brown bear. Oh, sorry, said Olive. Don't worry. Happens all the time. I'm Sir Derek Jacobair. I'm Olive. Pleased to meet you. But why are you crying? It's the opening night of the play. The actress I'm performing with hasn't arrived. I'm scared I'll forget my lines. Oh, dear. Well, I could be the actress. But I don't know the lines either. This is a disaster. What are we going to do, lovey? Olive saw that there was a big book sitting on a table next to a bottle of glue. Is that the play we're performing in? That's the one, Eleventh Night by William Shakespeare. And what do you use the glue for? I use it to stick this false beard on for the play. A script? Some glue? I think I may have an idea. With Sir Derek's help, Olive tore out all the pages from the script and stuck them everywhere. On the curtains, on the props, even on the stage itself. Oh, I see. Now we don't have to remember our lines. We can just read them. Bravo, lovey. As Derek stuck on his false beard, Olive put on the final piece of her costume, a huge feathery hat. Derek gave her one last piece of advice. Break a leg, lovey. <coughs> Olive looked confused. It's what we say in the theatre. It means good luck. And with that, the curtain went up and the play began. Olive and Derek moved around the stage, reading the lines and acting out the play. Everything was going brilliantly until one of the big feathers on Olive's hat fell in front of her eyes. She couldn't well, see where she was going. One of her long shoes caught on a page that she had glued to the stage. Olive fell off the stage and into the audience. But the audience caught Olive and lifted her up high above their heads. She crowd surfed all the way around the theatre before eventually landing back on the stage. And with that, the play was over. The audience went wild, clapping and cheering. This play is a huge success. Boom, Sir Derek. I have my beautiful leading lady to thank for that. He leaned over and gave Olive a kiss on her beak. Whoa. Oh, I say. I didn't break a leg, but I've got a few bruises from falling off the stage. <laughs> they both laughed, and as they did, Olive realised it was time to go. Oh, typical Olive daydreaming again, said her mum. Actually, I've been performing in a spectacular play. Your head's been in the sand too long, dear, said Olive's dad. Her little brother laughed. <laughs> but Olive wasn't listening. She was already dreaming of her next big adventure. Until she popped up somewhere new. 
It was a very dusty, hot place, with tumbleweed rolling past. Olive was on a cowboy ranch in the wild west of America. She was wearing a cowboy hat and cowboy boots. All of a sudden, she heard stamping feet and a loud wail. A little goat was riding along on the back of a huge bull. He was getting bumped about all over the place. Help! Help! The bull screeched to a halt, sending the poor goat somersaulting through the air. He landed at Olive's feet with a thump. Oh, hey. are you OK? Asked Olive. Oh, yeah, I'm fine, ma'am. Howdy, I'm Billy the Kid. What name do you go by? I'm Olive. Pleased to meet you, Billy. Is there anything I can do to help? Well, I just can't get these darn bulls into the barn. My daddy's gone to town and left me in charge of the ranch. He'll be real proud of me if I get him inside before sundown. I'd be glad to help. What have you tried so far? Well, I've tried lassoing them. <laughs> I've tried shouting at them. Move your big behind right now. And I've tried poking them. Hmm. Maybe I can think of something. Olive looked about and saw Billy's lasso lying on the ground. She also spotted a tall stack of hay bales inside the barn. She glanced back at the bulls and saw that they were grazing on clumps of hay. A lasso? Some bales of hay? I think I may have an idea. With Billy the Kid's help, Olive tied a bale of hay around herself using his lasso. Then she stood in front of the barn doors. Yoo-hoo! Bulls tasty hay! The bulls looked up and began to trot towards Olive. It's working! They're trotting towards the barn! The bulls started munching on Olive's mm. bale of hay. Unfortunately, Olive was very ticklish. Billy looked at Olive and was worried. Stop it! Stop it! Cried Billy. Stop it, bulls, please! Immediately, the bulls stopped munching and looked up at Billy the Kid. Why, sure thing, kid, said one of the bulls. I think I've got it! Excuse me, bulls. I know you'd make Billy here very happy if you all went inside the barn. Please! Oh, yeah. Yes, please. Said Billy, catching on. Well, of course we will. We bulls love politeness. You should have just asked nicely, saying please, the first place, Billy. Billy and Olive led all the bulls into the barn. Oh, why, thank you very much. See you in the morning, fellas. Just as the sun was setting, Billy's dad arrived home from town. Howdy, partners, said Billy's dad. Cheapest, you've done a fine job today, son. Any trouble getting those bulls into that there barn? Well, just a little bit, said Billy with a smile. But we're just pleased to get the job done, said Olive. <laughs> they all laughed, and as they did, Olive realised it was time to go. Typical Olive, daydreaming again, said her mum. Okay, actually, I've been a cowgirl in the Wild West. Your head's been in the sand too long, dear, said Olive's dad. Her little brother laughed. <laughs> but Olive wasn't listening. She was already dreaming of her next big adventure. Until she popped up somewhere new. Olive was standing in a big science laboratory, surrounded by test tubes filled with colourful bubbling liquids. She wore a white lab coat and a big pair of safety goggles. Suddenly, she heard a voice. Ah, no, 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 no. What is the answer to this problem? Olive turned around and saw a small man in a lab coat. He was muttering to himself and staring into a microscope. Hello, I'm Olive. Ouch, you startled me. I am Professor Comover, but you can call me Hair Comover. I am a very busy scientist. What can I do for you? I was going to ask you the same thing. Are you in a spot of bother? I've been trying to invent a cure for baldness for many years. It's driving me mad. The professor turned and picked up two bottles from the table. I need to mix together the right ingredients for the cure. If I do, I will have beautiful flowing hair again. Oh, how I miss my hair. Look, this is me when I was younger. Handsome, eh? 
I just can't find the right ingredients. I don't know much about ingredients for your cure, I'm afraid. Then Olive spotted something in the corner of the lab. Hmm, a mop? I think I may have an idea. Close your eyes, Herr Combover. Professor Combover closed his eyes. Olive pulled the handle off the mop and stuck it on top of the professor's head. You can open your eyes now. The professor looked in a mirror. I, I look like my great aunt Brunhilde. He shrieked. I don't want this. I want to grow my own. All right, keep your hair on. <sighs> look, if you really want to help, uh, I need you to get that big blue book down from the shelf. Well, this book can't have been open in a very long time. It's covered in dust. Olive opened the book and dust flew up everywhere. And Olive couldn't help sneezing. Achoo! The sneeze made her fall backwards into a shelf filled with hundreds of bottles. One of them toppled over and poured orange liquid into a beaker of purple liquid on the table. No, wait, that's not good. Cried the professor. All of a sudden there was a huge... Bang! I don't believe it. It's a miracle. You did it, Olive. You found the cure for baldness. You are a scientific genius. <laughs> Professor Comover was so excited, he danced about all over the place. Thanks very much. Beamed Olive. It was then she caught her own reflection in the mirror. <laughs> Well, I like it, but this huge hairdo could take some getting used to. Hey, would you like me to style yours a bit? Why not? Replied the professor. Using a comb and a pair of scissors, Olive went to work styling the professor's new hairdo. What do you think? Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. Thank you very much. Well, it looks like you won't be needing to read this dusty old science book anymore. Oh no, I'm going to... I've lost all me hair. Oh, well. Here today, gone tomorrow, eh? <laughs> they both laughed. And as they did, Olive realised it was time to go. Oh, typical Olive daydreaming again. Said her mum. Okay. Actually, I've been helping cure boldness. Your head's been in the sand too long, dear, said Olive's dad. Her little brother laughed. <laughs> but Olive wasn't listening. She was already dreaming of her next big adventure. Until she popped up somewhere new. Olive was standing by a swimming pool, surrounded by lots of cheering people. She was wearing a bright yellow swimming costume and goggles. Are all these people here to see me? Suddenly, a voice boomed out from some loudspeakers. Up next in the high diving competition is Braveheart Beaver, the undefeated five-time gold medal winner. Olive realised she was in the queue for a high diving board behind Braveheart Beaver and an elephant. A high diving competition? And I must be one of the contestants! exclaimed Olive. Olive was wondering why the elephant in front of her was shaking. I'm Olive. Why are you shaking? Hello, I'm n -n nervous Nelly, said the elephant. I'm shaking because I'm a bit n -n nervous about jumping off that high d -d 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 diving board. I have this terrible fear of heights. Olive looked up at the diving board. Oh, oh I see. It is rather high. <laughs> Braveheart Beaver scores 26, said the announcer. Up next, Nervous Nelly. I can't do it, said Nelly sadly. I can't do it. I'm off home. She slowly walked towards the door, hanging her head and trunk in shame. Olive tried to think of an idea to help Nelly. It was then that she spotted a man with a beard selling peanuts. Peanuts! Get your fresh salty peanuts here, shouted the man. Elephants love peanuts. I think I may have an idea. Olive quickly bought a pack of peanuts and began to drop a trail of peanuts along the floor, up the steps of the diving board and then along the diving board itself. Nelly noticed the trail of peanuts. Oh, I love peanuts. She exclaimed. She followed the trail, eating the peanuts as she walked towards the ladder 
then up the ladder and along the end of the diving board where Olive was standing. If you want the rest, you'll have to eat them before they get wet. Olive threw the rest of the peanuts off the edge of the diving board. Nelly left off after the peanuts. She sucked up all the peanuts as they fell through the air, spectacularly twisting around all over the place before landing in the pool with an almighty splash. Nervous Nelly scores 27, said the announcer. And now we have one more contestant, Olive the Ostrich. OK, now for my big finish. Olive gathered all her courage and ran towards the edge of the board. But the board was still covered in peanuts. Olive slipped and lost her balance. She went flying off the board, doing a flip, a triple backwards somersault and a corkscrew spin. Olive scores a perfect 30. She's the winner. I can't believe it. I won the gold medal, exclaimed Olive. And I can't believe I overcame my fear of heights, said Nelly. Oh, thanks for all your help, Olive. Oh, it was nothing. As the crowd continued to clap and cheer, Olive realised it was time to go. Typical Olive, daydreaming again, said her mum. But, Greg, actually, I won a high diving competition. Your head's been in the sand too long, dear, said Olive's dad. Her little brother laughed. <laughs> but Olive wasn't listening. She was already dreaming of her next big adventure. Until she popped up somewhere new. Ooh. Olive was standing in a huge room with large pictures on the walls ah. and big, oddly shaped oh. objects all over the place. Oh, what a colourful place! Suddenly, Olive heard a voice. Ah, where did I put them? One of the objects began to move. It was a seagull. It wore a beret and was waving around a paintbrush. Olive jumped. <coughs> I didn't notice you back there. I'm Olive. Uh, greetings. I'm Vincent van Gogh, famous artist and sculptor. This is my gallery, and these are my paintings and sculptures. You like them, yes? Oh, they're fantastic! exclaimed Olive. Yeah, I agree. I'm very talented, it's true. But I just need to paint one more painting on this blank canvas for my big exhibition. Problem is, I can't find my tubes of paint. God! Then Olive noticed something shining on one of the sculptures. Hmm. A telescope? I think I may have an idea. Olive looked through the telescope for clues, and on the floor she spotted some drips of paint. She followed the trail of paint over to a sculpture of a man having a good old think. Here's one, said Olive, throwing it down to Vincent. Ah, oh, my green paint! Here's another! Oh, my yellow paint! Olive continued to follow the trail, finding Vincent's Ooh. tubes of paint in all sorts of interesting ah. places. She found Vincent's uh -huh. blue paint, his orange paint, and his purple paint. Uh -huh. Vincent was very pleased. Oh, yes, I must have left my paints in my great works of art as I was creating them. <laughs> well spotted, Olive. You have the eye of a great artist. Thanks very much. Uh, but where is my lucky colour, red? Hey, I think I see it. Olive had spotted it at the very top of the tallest sculpture in the room. Gah, how are we going to reach that? Don't worry, Vincent. I'll get it. Olive jumped up on the sculpture and started to climb. She reached out and just managed to knock the paint down to Vincent. Oh, well done, Olive! He exclaimed. Now I have all my paints. As Olive cheered, Yay! she lost her balance. Oh, look out! Crash! Olive landed on top of Vincent, who dropped his tubes of paint, which squirted all over Olive as they hit the ground. Okay cried Olive as she stumbled backwards, covered in paint, and fell onto the blank canvas. Cock! Oh, no! Are you all right, Olive? I'm OK, but I think I've ruined your canvas. But when Olive pulled herself away from the canvas, on it was an amazing multicoloured painting of Olive. 
It's spectacular! exclaimed Vincent. It's a masterpiece, the best in my big exhibition. Hey, I've always wanted to be in a painting, giggled Olive. <laughs> They both laughed, and as they did, Olive realised it was time to go. Oh, typical Olive, daydreaming again, said her mum. Okay. Actually, I had a painting in an art exhibition. Your head's been in the sand too long, dear, said Olive's dad. Her little brother laughed. <laughs> but Olive wasn't listening. She was already dreaming of her next big adventure. Until she popped up somewhere new. Olive was outside in the rain, right in the middle of a large muddy field. She was wearing a maroon-coloured shirt and was holding an umbrella to keep her dry. Oh, Bakirk! I'm wearing a sports kit! There was a goal at each end of the muddy field, and behind one of the goals there was a large tree laden with apples. Hey! <laughs> number seven! shouted a tall pig with a clipboard. Hello! I'm Olive! I'm Sean Curlytail. I coach the Richmond Hockey Hogs. He said, pointing towards a group of pigs all wearing the same maroon kit as Olive. And you must be our missing team member. Oh, how exciting! Problem is, you're not the only thing missing. Today, I forgot to bring the hockey sticks and hockey balls. We can't play hockey without them. Olive looked at the big apple tree. Hmm. Some apples? My umbrella? I think I may have an idea. Olive organised the team into a large pyramid with hair at the very top. Olive hooked her umbrella around a branch that had lots of apples hanging down from it. She shook the branch and all the apples fell off it and tumbled to the ground. Oh, this is all well and good and apples are very tasty. But how does this help us play hockey? Well, a hockey ball is small and round like an apple. And a hockey stick is a long, straight stick with a curve on the bottom. A bit like this umbrella. Oh, brilliant idea, Olive. Uh, but to play a game of hockey, we all need a stick. Excuse me, piped up a small pig. I'm Sophie Swine, the captain of the Hogs. Why don't we have a penalty shootout? We only need one stick for that. Great idea, said Sean. And he quickly organised the competition. Each pig would get one shot on goal, using an apple as the ball and Olive's umbrella as the hockey stick. Sophie Swine volunteered to play in goal. Everyone took turns to shoot. Some shot too high, some shot too low. But every time, Sophie would get in the way of the apple ball and eat it, stopping it going into the goal. For one shot, she even did a backward somersault, landing on her feet and gobbling up the apple. Well, you're the last player, Olive. No one has managed to get a goal yet. So if you score a goal now, then you're the winner. Olive took a long run up and swung for the apple ball. But the pitch was so wet, she slipped. Her shot had lost all of its power. Olive watched as the ball rolled slowly towards the line. But instead of saving the apple ball by eating it, Sophie simply let it roll through her legs and into the goal. Goal! shouted Sean. Olive's the winner! The other pigs cheered and lifted Olive high into the air. Dick, hee hee, I'm glad I won. Sophie, why didn't you save my shot? Sorry I would have done, but my tummy's too full of apples, said Sophie, before letting out a huge burp. <laughs> <laughs> they all laughed, and as they did, Olive realised it was time to go. Oh, typical Olive, daydreaming again, said her mum. But Eric, actually, I've been playing a wonderful game of hockey. Your head's been in the sand too long, dear, said Olive's dad. Her little brother laughed. <laughs> but Olive wasn't listening. She was already dreaming of her next big adventure. Until she popped up somewhere new. The sun was high in the sky and Olive found herself in the middle of a desert. She was wearing a strange hat. Oh, Bakirk, what a big fancy hat. But where am I? And what are these big spiky things?
things. Are they some sort of plant? Suddenly, something long and squiggly appeared right behind Olive. When she noticed it, she was so surprised she stumbled Ugh. back straight into one of the spiky plants. Ugh. Ow! Ow! Me bottom! Me bottom! Ooh. I'm sorry. Please let me help you. <sighs> Olive sighed, relieved. I'm Olive. Thanks so much for pulling out those horrible spikes. I didn't hear you coming. That's why I got so surprised. Hola, I am Reptilina. I am a rattlesnake. Sorry that I scared you. That's OK. I can see you're not scary. Whenever I try to make friends, they always get scared away. All the rattlesnakes have rattles on their tails, so you can hear them coming. But mine, it don't work, see? People get scared of snakes, especially when they can't hear them coming. Hmm. Well, we'll have to find something that can make your tail sound again. Olive looked around the desert. Soon, she spotted an old bicycle horn. Oh, this will make a great new sound for your tail. She carefully attached the horn to Reptilina's tail, and Reptilina tried it out. <laughs> mm, it's a nice sound, but not quite right. Hmm, what about these? Olive had found some bells on the ground. Reptilina tried them instead of the horn. Uh, it's a bit closer, but my tail should rattle, you know. Olive looked around once more. She spotted some rubbish left Ooh. after a campfire. An empty can of beans, some small rocks and a stick. I think I may have an idea. Olive put the small rocks and the stick inside the can. Then she attached it to Reptilina's tail. Give this a try. Oh, Olive, this is perfect. Thank you so much. Suddenly, Olive and Reptilina heard some music. Two men in big oh. hats appeared. Both were playing guitars. Hola, we are local mariachi band, and that is a beautiful sounding rattling tail you have. Why, thank you. Replied Reptilina. Hey, our drama is very ill after eating a mega spicy burrito, and now we can't keep our rhythm. Said the other mariachi. But maybe you, your amazing rattling tail, could join our band. Ah, uh, I think I'm too shy. Reptilina said sadly. Don't be shy, Reptilina. Said Olive. I'll even join in myself. Olive picked up the horn. One, two, one, two, three, four. This must be the best sounding rattle tail ever. Olive played along with Reptilina and the mariachi band until the sun was setting. Thanks so much for getting me my rattle back, said Reptilina. And thanks for finding out a new rhythm section, said the mariachi. That's OK, said Olive. I was a bit rattled when I first arrived, but now I feel just fine. <laughs> <laughs> they all laughed, and as they did, Olive realised it was time to go. Typical Olive, daydreaming again. Said her mum. OK. Actually, I was in a band with a rattlesnake. Your head's been in the sand too long, dear. Said Olive's dad. Her little brother laughed. <laughs> but Olive wasn't listening. She was already dreaming of her next big adventure. She popped up somewhere new. Olive was standing on a large grey planet. She was wearing a strange helmet that was attached to a big backpack. Oh, look at the sky! Isn't it beautiful? Suddenly, a little green man popped out of one of the holes. He was carrying a bright red handbag. Oh dear, oh dear! He said as he hurried past Olive. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear, oh dear! Hello, my name's Olive. What's the hurry? The little green man stopped. Oh, hello, oh, hello. My name is Buzza Palema Hoopilaga Rupilaba Baba Baja Camoo Beep. But you can call me Sarah. Oh, hey, Sarah. That's an odd name for a little man. Well, of course, I am an alien. That's true. Nice to meet you, Sarah. I've never met an alien before. Well, it's nice to meet you too, but I'm in a real hurry. Can't stop and chat. But why are you in such a rush? It's my mum's birthday and I've bought her a sunstone. Problem is, I'm so forgetful I've gone and forgotten where I've put it and my mum will be here in her spaceship any minute now. Oh dear, 
I could help you look, but I don't know what a sunstone looks like. Sarah opened his handbag and took out a large pad of paper and some crayons. I'm a great drawer. I can draw you a picture of a sunstone, and then maybe you could help me look for it, Olive. Sarah sat down and drew a lovely picture of a big red stone. Olive looked thoughtfully at the drawing. Your picture's really good. In fact, it's so good, I think I may have an idea. Why don't you draw lots and lots of pictures of the sunstone and write missing across it in big letters? I'll pin them up and then if anyone sees the stone, they'll know where to hand it in. So Sarah sat and drew picture after picture after picture. And Olive ran all around the planet, pinning them anywhere and everywhere. Eventually, the whole planet was covered in pictures of the sunstone. Olive and Sarah waited and waited and waited. Oh, dear. No one's come to tell us they found the sunstone. And after all that work we did... Oh, hang on. I forgot. No one else lives on this planet but me. Oh, so no one else is going to see our posters anyway? Well, now we're never going to find the sunstone. The whole planet is covered in our posters. Oh, no. Here comes my mum. Just then, Sarah's mum arrived in her spaceship. She was wearing a beautiful red stone around her neck, just like the ones in the pictures. Oh, my goodness. Sarah's mum exclaimed. You've decorated the whole planet for my birthday. And thank you so much for this lovely sunstone. It arrived in the space mail this morning. Olive shook her head and <laughs> chuckled. Sarah, you're so forgetful. You forgot you'd already sent the sunstone to your mum in the space mail. Maybe you should write everything down so you don't forget things in the future. Of course. That's what the crayons and the paper were for. They all laughed. And as they did, Olive realised it was time to go. Oh, typical Olive daydreaming again, said her mum. Forget? Actually, I've been to another planet and helped an alien. Your head's been in the sand too long, dear, said Olive's dad. Her little brother laughed. <laughs> but Olive wasn't listening. She was already dreaming of her next big adventure. She popped up somewhere new. Olive found herself in a room with shelves and worktops piled high with mounds oh. of dust. She was wearing an apron decorated with pictures of violins, cellos and bassoons. Okay. This place could do with a spot of dusting. Just then, two smiling woodworms <laughs> popped their head out of a dust pile. Oh, hello, said Olive. The woodworms vanished before popping up from another dust pile. <laughs> My, you're both quick on your feet. <laughs> I mean, tummies. Before either worm had a chance to reply, whoosh, a large net fell over them, sending clouds of dust up into the air. The dust... Made Olive cough. <coughs> Did I get them? Yeah. No. Ah, missed them again. As the dust cleared, she found herself face to face with a tall wolf wearing an apron just like his. Hello, I am Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, instrument maker to the king. This is my workshop. Hi, Olive. Nice to meet you, Wolfgang. But, um... I don't see any instruments. This was a cello. This was a violin. And this was a bassoon to be played at the King's birthday concert tonight. Oh. I don't think you'll get much sound out of those instruments. This I know. It's those woodworm. As soon as I make any instrument from wood, they eat it. See? If I don't make the bassoon for the king's birthday concert tonight, he will be very upset. You must help me, Olive. Olive thought hard. Well, if the woodworm, oh, <laughs> I mean woodworm, only like to eat wood, maybe you could make a bassoon out of something else. But what? Olive looked around at things in the workshop. Hmm. A vacuum cleaner, a bicycle pump... I think I may have an idea. With Wolfgang's help, Olive used the vacuum cleaner's bendy pipe to form the body of the bassoon. 
Then they use the top of the bicycle pump as its mouthpiece. Finished! Now to see how it sounds, yeah? Wolfgang placed his lips to the bicycle pump mouthpiece and blow. Is that how the sword is supposed to sound, Wolfgang? Wolfgang stopped playing and shook his head. No, that sounded terrible. Just then, Olive remembered how the woodworm had reacted to the sound. Hmm. Those greedy woodworm didn't like the noise the bassoon made either. Wolfgang, you start to make your new wooden bassoon for the King's birthday concert. I think I know how I can keep those woodworm away. Olive blew into the bassoon as she marched up and down. The woodworm couldn't stand the noise and soon they wiggled away. And at last, Wolfgang finished making what would be his finest wooden bassoon. Ah, perfect. Thank you, Olive. Without your help, the concert would have been a disaster. Would you like to come as my guest? Um, I think I've heard enough bassoons for one day, thank you. <laughs> they both laughed. And as they did, Olive realised it was time to go. Typical Olive, daydreaming again. Said her mum. Okay. Actually, I helped make a bassoon for a king. Your head's been in the sand too long, dear. Said Olive's dad. Her little brother laughed. <laughs> but Olive wasn't listening. She was already dreaming of her next big adventure. <laughs> she popped up somewhere new. <laughs> this is a spectacular place. Olive saw a man with a huge curly moustache. He wore a red and black tunic with a crown on the front. I'm Olive. Where am I, please? I'm Beefy the Beefeater. You're on a tour of the Tower of London. He answered. Brick I'm in London. Olive found a camera hanging around her neck and snapped a few pictures. And if you look to your right, you'll see the ravens. Tradition says they must never leave the tower or the kingdom will fall. And not a single one has. Not on my watch, anyhow. Hello. What's your name? Olive asked. Roberta. And why do you look so sad, Roberta? Because I really want to explore London, like those tourists over there. I want to see all the sights, Big Ben, Buckingham Palace, and especially Trafalgar Square. But of course you can't leave the tower, said Olive. No, and Beefy is always watching and counting us. Hmm. So you need to somehow get away without Beefy realising. Olive looked around and saw an ice cream van nearby. She also saw a lady tourist wearing a long black raincoat. An ice cream van? A black raincoat? I think I may have an idea. Please, can I borrow your raincoat? Olive asked the lady, who nodded. Oh. Then she bought an ice cream cone from the ice cream van. Olive ah. put on the black raincoat and stuck the cone onto her own beak, using the ice cream to make it stick. She looked just like a raven. Well, almost. I'll pretend to be you, Roberta, while you go to see the sights of London. Wow! Great idea! When Beefy was looking the other way, Roberta made a dash through the tower gates. Olive tried to blend in with the other ravens, but she was so tall she really stuck out. What was worse, the ice cream cone was melting, dripping into a growing puddle at her feet. Beefy walked over and began counting the ravens. One, two, three, four... When he got to Olive, he stopped and raised an eyebrow. Ah. Said Olive. It was a pretty good impression of a raven. Beefy shrugged and continued to count. Five, six ravens. Excellent. But now, Olive's ice cream had melted so much, the cone fell off her beak. Hang on a raven counting minute. You're not a raven. You're an ostrich. <clears throat> I'd better count again. Oh, no. He's going to realise there's one raven missing. Beefy began to count. One, two, three, four, five. Only five? But just in the nick of time, Roberta came swooping in over the Tower of London's walls. She landed just behind Beefy. Ah! Said Roberta loudly. Beefy spun round. 
Aha! There's number six all safe and sound. What was I thinking? It's not like these ravens ever leave the tower. Not on my watch, anyway. <laughs> Beefy walked off to get his dinner. No! Us ravens never leave the tower! <laughs> Chuckled Roberta. This made Olive and the other ravens laugh, too. And as they did, Olive realised it was time to go. Typical Olive, daydreaming again, said her mum. OK, actually, I've been a raven in the Tower of London. Your head's been in the sand too long, dear, said Olive's dad. Her little brother laughed. <laughs> but Olive wasn't listening. She was already dreaming of her next big adventure. <laughs> <laughs> 